Well, good morning, everyone. I hope none of you have been here for an hour and you all remember to turn your clocks back okay. Uh, it's good to see you. Well done for braving the rain and the wind and for getting here to be part of our worship this morning. We gather here because generations before have gathered in this place, have faithfully taught the scriptures, have faithfully sung the faith, have lived lives that have passed the faith on to us. And this weekend, the weekend where we celebrate All Souls Day, there is, there is the circuit service here uh, at Trinity Gosforth uh, on Sunday tonight, six o'clock, different Trinity, um, where we will specifically be remembering uh, folk within our own circuit who have died during the last couple of years uh, as a special way of us celebrating all souls. But as we gather here, we remember especially that we gather because people in the past have been faithful. They have heard the call, they have kept the faith, and they have passed it on to us. And as we gather for worship, we do that in the light of what they have given to us. And our opening hymn is a very well-known hymn, but it's a hymn that talks about our journey on with God. And that goes on day by day, month by month, year by year, and we are the pilgrim people. So as we continue this series that we're having on the Methodist way of life, today we think particularly about our learning and caring on the journey. So let's stand and worship God. Guide me, O oh thou great Jehovah. together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the beautiful images in that hymn that remind us of your leading of your people from slavery to freedom across the River Jordan. And Lord, we thank you that you too have led us and guided us. 
We thank you that you are a God who walks with us through all the changing scenes of life. We thank you that you are the one who has sought us. You have saved us. You have rescued us. You have given us the gift of your spirit. And day by day, by your grace, we try and live responding to all that we have learnt of you. Loving God, we pray that in this time of worship, you would enable us to know both your presence and your power. In the words that we sing and hear, may your spirit enliven our hearts that this service of worship would not just be a going through the motions of familiar things that we say and do, but that our hearts would be strangely warmed again. Lord, you are the one who not only acted in the past, but who acts in the present. You are our reason for being here. You are the purpose of all that we do and say and try to be. And so, although our words and our praise are inadequate, we offer them to you. And though our lives and our actions don't always enlighten people, aren't always the best that we would hope to be, we offer ourselves to you again, asking that your Holy Spirit would cleanse and heal us, that you would forgive and restore us, and that you would renew us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment that we might be the people you call us to be, both now and every day. Amen. As we continue to think about learning and journeying with God, we sing our next hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us.
have our two readings now. First, our Old Testament reading uh, from uh, Genesis, and then the New Testament reading from Acts. The Lord chooses Abram. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your family, and your relatives, and go to the land that I will show you. I will bless you and make your descendants into a great nation. You will become famous and be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, but I will put a curse on anyone who puts a curse on you. Everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. Abram was 75 years old when the Lord told him to leave the city of Horam. He obeyed and left with his wife, Sari, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions and slaves they had acquired while they lived there. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram went as far as the sacred tree of Morah, in a place called Shechem. The Canaanites were still living in the land at that time. But the Lord appeared to Abram and promised, I will give this land to your family forever. Abram then built an altar there for the Lord. Abram travelled to the hill country east of Bethel and camped between Bethel and Ai, where he built another altar and worshipped the Lord. Later, Abram started out towards the southern desert. Amen. A reading from Acts, Life Among the Lord's Followers. All the Lord's followers often met together, and they shared everything they had. They would sell their property and possessions, and give the money to whoever was in need. Day after day, they met together in the temple. They broke bread together in different homes, and shared their food happily and freely while praising God. Everyone liked them, and every day the Lord added to their group who were being saved. Amen. When I first got married 29 years ago, my husband uh, was chaplain at the university in Liverpool and at the uh, college that was there, St. Catherine's College, which is now Liverpool Hope University. It was the time when all the names were changing round. We had a lot of students around and there was one young man who you might have thought had quite a poor background because you only ever saw him in two, maybe three different shirts. All of the shirts were football shirts for Preston North End. He was an avid Preston North End supporter. And wherever he went, whether it was at church on Sunday, whether it was when he was preaching, because he started preaching during his time, it took us a long time to persuade him that maybe wearing a Preston North End football shirt wasn't always the best thing. It was fine sometimes, but always. But you know, with that young man called Jamie, you had no doubt where his allegiance lay. He didn't just go to the matches on Saturday he would, uh, Preston, if you know your geography, is just a little bit north of Liverpool, so he would pop home, go to the match, and then come back. Uh, and then he would phone his dad on a Saturday evening to get his dad to read the match report that he'd been to that was in the local paper that night. He was obsessed with Preston North End. Now, nobody said to him that he needed to study and learn about Preston North End. He did because it was a joy. He wanted to know all about the players. He wanted to know what clubs they had played at before they came. He wanted to know about the manager and where the manager had been and what kind of system the manager Played. He wanted to know everything he could about Preston North End. Now I'm guessing there's probably nobody here this morning who is obs as obsessed with Preston North End that, as he was. Is that a fair kind of guess? Yes. Now, 
Yeah, who is it? There was no point where he said, you know, I followed this football team ever since I was a little lad. My dad took me along. Do you know, I think I know enough about them now. I'd have nothing new to learn. Uh, I'll just rock up to the games on Saturday. He never did that because he was passionate about his football. We're looking at the Methodist way of life. We've spent two weeks looking at worship. We're now looking at learning and caring. What does it mean as Christians to learn and care as part of our expression of our faith? My young friend Jamie, who's now a lay leader in a church in America because he lectures at a university out there, is still as avidly obsessed with Preston. It's slightly more tricky to follow it on a different time scale. But he continued to learn because he was passionate. One of the things that we are called to as Christians, not, not just as Methodists, as Christians, in living out our faith is to have that same passion to learn. To continue to learn about God, about God's ways, about the stories of Jesus. And I have to tell you that there is always more to learn. There is always more to learn. Now, some of you are a little bit older than me. And some of you might say, well, Alison, we've been Christians longer than you've been alive. You have. You have. I'm sure you have, some of you. Because I'm very young. But I know that part of our calling as people of faith is to continue to learn. Our first reading was that reading from Genesis at the beginning of Abraham's journey. We know him as Abraham. He gets his name changed later on. Paul Susan had to cope with his new, sh- his old shortened name. We, may not, we might not think, who's that? It, it's Abraham. But they, at the moment, his name's shortened. He hasn't had it extended. And uh, we guess around 80 years old, 80, that probably is, covers a lot of you. I don't think we've got any 90-year-olds here this morning, have we? No? Okay, so he's, he's in your age bracket, however, or older than you. God called him to leave everything he knew and to trust him and to go on a journey. Now, we talk about faith like that journey. It's not normal and every day for God to call people to leave everything and go off. He does do that. Margaret Story has heard that call, hasn't she? And gone. But But for most of us, we hear that call But it's still the call to journey with God. And one of the things that the Methodist way of life encourages us to do there you go was is to continue to learn. And those verses we had read to us from Acts, they are at the time of the early church, not long after Jesus has died been resurrected and gone back to heaven, the early disciples gathered. And these verses are really famous. They're famous because of the marks of what it was to follow Jesus in that day. Now, I have to say, when you read them, they sound like a perfect lot. They sound like they don't have any problems or difficulties in the community. Because uh, as we go through this, these verses, you'll see it, it's it sounds perfect. It sounds amazing. Um, And I'm sure they had days like that. But I want to remind you that when we read the letters to the early churches in the New Testament, we find that sometimes they did have arguments and disagreements. But this is, this if you you like, is the, the perfect picture of what we're aiming at. And those early disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to it. It wasn't that they didn't know anything about Jesus. Most of them had lived with him and seen him. 
but they devoted themselves to continuing to learn and learn more. Now, I have a very clever husband. I don't know if you know that, but I have a very clever husband and he works at the university. He has a very big brain. And I always say, he's so clever, he decided to marry me. Well, that didn't get the reaction I was hoping for. <laughs> very clever man. But following and learning is not about how clever we are. Following and learning is about us learning about God. And if God is bigger than us, if God is infinite, then probably none of us are going to learn everything there is to learn about God. There's still going to be more to learn. And it may be that sometimes we have to learn the same things again. Do you ever have that? Where you know, we know God's faithful, don't we? And we say it. God's faithful. God's a faithful God. And then you go through a difficult time, and it's hard, and you remember God is faithful. And you kind of learn it in a different way, don't you? You learn it again through the experience. As Christians, we're called to continually be learning and growing in our faith. And today, when we remember all souls and we remember those who have died in the faith, we remember that there are people who taught us the faith. There'll be people here who've taught you the faith, but there'll be people who've already died who taught you the faith. Maybe you can remember Bible study leaders or ministers or preachers or Sunday school teachers who had an impact on you to teach the faith. We as Christians are called to continue to learn, to continue to grow, to continue to read the scriptures and learn more of what it means to be faithful. And if we reach perfection, this side of heaven, we can give up. But I guess most of us are not going to reach perfection this side of heaven. And we're going to have to still keep working at learning. The other thing, the other thing they did was they shared together. Uh, I, I've used a different translation, I realize, to the one that Mark read. So forgive me, some of the words are slightly different. Um, but they shared together. Mark, Mark's version talked about the meeting in each other's houses. You heard that. That's the sharing together. Uh, and there's a special word that's used uh, for fellowship in the New Testament. It, it's a Greek word, uh, obviously. Um, and it, it's called kornonia. And we, we translate it as fellowship, sharing together. But it's not just... We had a great coffee morning and it was lovely fellowship. We use it sometimes in that sense, don't we? We had a nice meal out with the youth club leaders and we had lovely fellowship together. Uh, and, and by fellowship, we mean we, we had a nice time with each other. Fellowship doesn't mean we had a nice time with each other. I've never been to a church in all the churches I've ever been to in different places around the country where any church has ever said to me, you know, we're really rubbish at fellowship. Every church says they're great at fellowship. Every church says they're great at fellowship. But fellowship is not we like each other and we're nice to the people in the congregation who we like. That is not fellowship. The Greek word means a sharing together. A, a deep sharing together of the life of faith. It's being a Christian and helping each other be Christians together. That's what fellowship is. It's not we had, a, we had a laugh or we enjoyed catching up with the news. It's a much deeper connection. The apostles learned together and they shared fellowship, koinonia. And do you know what? That word becomes the word for the Christian community. Koinonia, the sharing together of the Christian life and helping and growing and enabling each other together. This is what the Methodist way of life means by our sharing and learning and caring. 
It's not being nice to the people who are nice to us. It's showing God's love to the people that maybe we find a bit difficult. You know, I never go to a church where they say, we've got a few difficult people, you know. But I've never found a church that didn't have a few difficult people. And how do we love the people that are different to us? I get on really well with my best friends. And I share a lot in common with my best friends. And that's one of the reasons I get on well with them. But God does not call us to get on well with people who we like. God calls us to fellowship and learning and caring together. And that is beyond just having a nice time. Uh, When my son was in primary school, he had a primary teacher who was really paranoid about handwriting. And she used to write on his, his exercise books, this handwriting is disgusting. I mean, it was. His handwriting's terrible. Okay, his dad's handwriting's terrible as well. But she didn't care if he'd written all the right answers. She just cared that he had really horrible handwriting. Now, I used to train teachers before I I was a teacher, and I trained teachers. And I know teachers aren't supposed to write nasty things like that on books. They're supposed to try and find a more positive way to express it. So I used to go to parents' evening very grumpy, because I didn't like this woman. And what happened over the year is Adam stopped writing because every time he wrote something in class, he got told off for handwriting. When he went to secondary school, the best description of his handwriting came from one teacher who said he writes as though he writes with a monkey jumping on his arm. And that was right. His handwriting is terrible. And I didn't like, I confess to you, I didn't like this teacher, but it was all right. I only had to see her a couple of times a year at parents' evening. I could be grumpy. I could, I could come to church and talk about loving people. And I could think, Pfft. And then one day, my Bible study group, we were in, we, every six or seven weeks, we had a social event where we invited people to invite friends who didn't come to church just as a way of getting to know people from the church as, and then might be an easier way to ask people to come. And would you know, one Bible study that I was leading, unsuspected, one of the Bible study group brought Adam's teacher to my Bible study. I didn't like her. I didn't like her. And God really challenged me. And I realized that I was quite happy saying I didn't like her and being grumpy and nasty about her here and keeping my faith here separate but the fellowship of learning and caring that we're called to as Christians is not about the people who we like and we find it easy to love it's about the ones that we really struggle with and God really challenged me and I had to struggle and struggle and struggle in order that I could be a better person to this teacher who I just wanted to be nasty to. Sometimes, maybe you're like me, you portion off certain people and you allow, you allow yourself to behave differently to them. Because you justify it. You've got your li- you heard my justification, didn't you? I told you all about it. But God calls us to love each other. And as a community, the calling to fellowship, to learning and caring together, is, n- is deeper than just having a cup of coffee together and liking each other. It's a caring and a love that only God can give us for each other. And I want to challenge you this morning to not parcel off people, but to feel that you need to come to God and say, help me, because that person is really annoying. But God, you can help me. You know, I wonder at times whether God thinks we're really annoying. (laughs) 
Just once in a while, he might think we're really annoying, but he still loves us. The calling to love and care is seen in fellowship, a deep caring of sharing our Christian lives together. Ooh, I'm not very good at this. The next thing they did together was they prayed together. That wasn't just when they gathered together for worship. They met in each other's houses They shared fellowship, they broke bread, and they prayed together. Have any of you done the Great North Run? You have? Great. I haven't done it, but I've heard it's wonderful. It's a great experience, yeah? One of the young people at Jesmond did it this year. She's the first time she'd done it. And they print your names on on your T-shirts. So she said, as you're running, people shout your name because they can read your name. And, and she's called Hannah. And she said she kept hearing, go, Hannah lass, go, Hannah lass, keep going. Now, I've never felt inspired to, to run 13 miles. But I know if I did and I had people beside me on the road shouting, go, Alison lass. There's an awful lot more chance I would do it because I would have people who were cheering me on. Our call to prayer is not just to pray on our own with God. Our call to prayer together is because it helps us when we pray together. Sometimes when I'm on my own and I'm praying and I'm paid to pray, okay, I'm paid to pray. I I start off praying And then I'm wondering about what's happening for tea. And then I remember that I've got to answer that email that I I, I didn't answer immediately because I thought I need to think about that. And then before I know where I am, I'm somewhere else. If I'm praying with someone else, they help me to stay focused. They cheer me on. We help each other together. If we're learning and growing as Christians and caring for each other, praying together is one of those things that helps cheer each other on. So we don't just pray on our own or pray corporately when we come together. We find places where we can pray together so that we can have people who help us. Go on, keep going, keep praying, keep trusting God. Just like those wonderful people that line the Great North Run and shout encouragement. That's our calling. The other thing they did as they learnt together, as they shared together, as they prayed together, they also expected that God would act. They expected it. They looked for it. They came to church to worship, expecting to encounter God and for that to maybe surprise them or challenge them or shock them. Do we do that? Do we sometimes come and feel so comfortable that when the new minister comes in and puts a cafe service that we all hate, we get very upset about because we don't like doing things differently and she's learnt, she won't make you do it too often it's good to learn but sometimes we so expect what we expect we actually expect nothing now I watch Newcastle play football so I expect a lot of nothing when I go and I'm very rarely surprised very rarely surprised but do we come to church expecting nothing do we come to church just expecting it to be the same old same old If I told you the Queen was coming, well, you'd know that's not true because she's ill. But if I told you the Queen was coming, I bet you'd change what you were going to wear. I bet you'd not turn up just as you normally do. You'd think, wow, the Queen's coming today. We meet with the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And I'm not saying you have to dress up, but I'm saying... We should come with that expectation that something exciting is going to happen because we meet with the living God and that's 
changed the world. That's changed the world. They gave. They learned. They shared together. They prayed together. They expected and they gave. They looked after each other. They made sure everyone was okay. And then the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Who does not want to go to a church that is continually growing in its understanding of faith, that is caring, that shares and prays together, that expects God to act, that gives and helps each other, and that the Lord adds to their number. When I was in Hartlepool, we had a baptism one service, and uh, the congregation was, would probably be around the size of, of, of the folk gathered here, but the baptismal party came in and outnumbered them about three to one, four to one. Uh, and uh, I, I, was, um, I wasn't leading the service at that point, uh, I was sitting in the congregation as uh, someone else was leading a bit of the service. And uh, the pianist obviously decided that Sunday there were all these people in. She probably needed to give it a little bit of extra oomph when she was playing. And I'm sitting in the church and two people from the congregation were sitting behind me. And one turned to the other and said, well, if she plays like that every week, they might come back. Like that was a bad thing. She didn't want them to come back because she'd had her church disrupted that morning. If she plays like that, they might come back. We often want people to come to church, but we want the church to stay exactly as it is because we like it. That's why we're here. But actually, when people come, it, it's a bit more disruptive. It changes things. But if we're learning together, if we're caring and sharing, if we're praying, if we're expecting God to ask, to act, if we're giving, then God will add to our number. He will use us. And that's why, as Christians, we're called to continue on a journey with God, to continue to go with God, to never give up, to never stop learning, because there's always more for us to do. It's the mark of what it is to be a Christian. It's the mark of a Christian community. That's what we're called to. And I think that's really exciting. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful picture of the early disciples as they gathered together to worship, to learn, to pray, to follow your leading. Loving God, we pray that you would help us to continue on our journeys of faith, to never get stuck or to set up camp and refuse to move, but to always be open to your spirit, pushing and guide, guiding and leading us on. Lord, we're not happy or content for our church to stay as it is. You call us to more and we seek you that we might learn and care together in Jesus' name, amen. Our next hymn uh, has part of it looking backwards, uh, and that's very deliberate for all souls. It's a hymn that reminds us of what God has done in the past, but it's also a hymn that looks forward to where God may take us, what God may do in and through us. Lord, for the years.
of us will be aware that the world leaders are gathering in Glasgow for COP26, uh, an important moment in history where we have the chance to make an impact on the climate change crisis. To be fair, most of us don't experience much of a crisis here because it's in different parts of the world where the crisis literally may mean that the places that people live are completely obliterated. So it's important this morning as we gather to pray, uh, as we think of what we are learning and what God is asking and calling us to do in the world, as we wash out our yogurt pots and we try to recycle, that today we pray for the governments and leaders that can make huge decisions that will really impact all of the world. So let's pray together. Loving God, there has been so much talk and prayer and concern around these next few days in Glasgow where world leaders come to debate and make, we hope, promises that will impact the whole of our world. Lord, we know that this is your world, created and held by you. And we know that human beings have acted sometimes in ways that have been destructive and selfish. Lord, as those leaders gather, we pray that there might be a yearning for justice, justice for the poorest who are most affected by climate change. Lord, we pray that you would soften hearts. We pray that this won't just be a talking shop. As the Queen said, it's so frustrating when they talk, but they don't do. Lord, may this be a point where they talk and they do. And we pray especially for the leaders of Russia, for China, and for Brazil, none of whom have sent their prime ministers or leaders, but they have other officials there. Lord, we pray that that would not hold back a unity amongst all the leaders to act to make things different. different. Loving God, we remember the parts of the world where there is great suffering at the moment, where there is huge injustices, where there is fighting. We think of the global refugee crisis as millions leave their homes fleeing persecution and fighting and famine and poverty. And alongside the issues of how the climate is, we pray for the other issues that will be discussed at COP26, like the refugee crisis. And we pray that those of us who are in the global north who have more resources and more power would use our influence to help the least and those who struggle the most. And Lord, closer to home, we pray for our own city in a time of growing upheaval, concern over food prices 
of energy prices soaring and of incomes being fixed. We pray today, especially for the work of those charities and organisations that stand with those who are struggling the most. We pray that as the eyes of the world are on Glasgow, that those closer to home who are struggling would not feel overlooked, but would know that they are loved and valued by you. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as we have already sung in living power remake us teach us what it means to put self on the cross and to have you on the throne of all our lives loving God we thank you that the purpose the point of all that we do here is that we might make your love known. Help us to walk the path of discipleship that you are calling us to do and help us by your grace that we might be faithful. Amen. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And we remember the gifts which have been given, and we ask God's blessing on all those gifts, that they would be used wisely in the furtherance of his kingdom in this place. Amen. Our final hymn is a hymn that looks to that perfect picture of what church and Christian life and Christian community can be. Let us build a house where love can dwell.
Shall we say the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.